So I have a, a bit of a grab bag of things to do in the next uh, half hour. We'll see how far I get. One of the things is something I want you to do for I mean, by I six, and I probably mean for I need six. Although possibly you could do it in the next couple of days here for I need five. It's it's not something that requires new development. It has to do with the estimating defects. So we talked about. Oh, sorry. Well, um, we talked about how there's this whole sort of pipeline associated with defects and issue resolution. And, you know, one of the biggest concerns in software development is not just the defects you know, but the defects what? You don't know. You don't know. Yeah. These ones up here. Where do those come from? Where do those defects come from? The fault, ladies and gentlemen, lies not in the stars, but in what's in Shakespeare? Not for so we're going to put that quote as ourselves. Um, so these, these come from us. Um, I've seen the anime, and the anime is about the village of Coco. Maybe you read Coco. Okay, well, I won't go on. Um, anyway, so um, I've got enough folks are a source of, to me, a source of making worry. You know, how big this set of undiagnosed bugs is. Because the ones you know about, the ones you sanitize and become active bugs, the ones that are sitting in your defect reports, in your issues, but you haven't yet had a chance to go through to figure out if the duplicates are outdated and all those sort of things. Um, these undiagnosed ones, you're typically not sure how big they are, because they're undiagnosed. You don't know them, right? Um, Today, we're going to be talking about a way to estimate this, just how big this is. And I want to know how big it is. That compartment, that their compartment in red, I want to know how big it is for your folks' project. Mm -hmm. I want you to go and estimate this for me. And I'll be a happy camper if you do that. So we're going to talk about three methods, very briefly. Each approach has has the potential of coming. But the last is a defect tool, which is the one our estimates feel about. It's the one that's most realistic for projects at your level of, of uh, size and experience and uh, time, time horizon. And it's also one that requires the least kind of instrumentation. Defect seeding requires tools to really do it well, or to do it um, most conveniently, historical data requires long histories. Defect pooling is something that you can all do. Um, it's not perfect, but it's a lot better than just not knowing at all. Um, so the idea with historic data is, uh, uh, suppose, suppose you had historic data, suppose you had data and I'm supposed to Google and you have 20 projects going on with similar combinations of Technologies uh, and maybe with Flutter and Firebase, et cetera, and different teams working on them. And suppose there's a project which is, you know, midway through its stages and they have, you know, a couple hundred issues found for it so far. Suppose you wanted to estimate just how big that, that stage of uh, undiagnosed defects is. Um, how might you? How might you try to oh um try to estimate this? If if you have these 20 other projects which have been undertaken, how might you try to estimate that? Yes, uh, the mark you can just draft look at those other projects and see number of undiagnosed defects there, and try to replicate it with the one scale. Yeah, I mean it, it's hard to know for those other projects, maybe we're not gonna make more defects of but we can at least now look um what the defect density was for the per thousand lines of code, how many defects did they have in the end when they shipped? Presumably they were pretty well tested, pretty well peer reviewed. You know, 
how many defects have been found and resolved by that. And so you might apply it to your own, to your own system, right? And, and here you have, you know, some number of, of defects that were ultimately found and some number that you found for your project. So maybe you found three defects per thousand lines of code, maybe maybe for the systems that shipped, by the time they shipped, there were 20 defects per thousand lines of code, or say you have two, two defects per thousand lines of code, they have 20, and you found 100 defects so far. So, about 100 defects so far, the systems that tended to ship said about 20 defects per thousand lines of code, and you have found so far two defects per thousand lines of code. Probably you've got about 10% of the defects. About two per thousand lines of code, and the and the mature systems will, by the time they ship, you know, they have declined. So you found about 10% of them. So if you found 100 defects so far. Probably you have a thousand defects altogether that you might be looking at. The problem with this is manifold. I mean, for a project of your size, you don't have this in your case. Technologies change all the time. I gave Google as an example, Flutter and Firebase, because these are extraordinarily popular projects. And chances are they have many, many teams that have been working on them at different levels of maturity. They can afford to do this. Microsoft can afford to do it. Facebook can afford to do it. Now, but, you know, for your team, this isn't too actionable, right? Because you don't have that long history. Another problem is, you know, um, quality standards may have changed. Even within your teams, you're getting better at coordinating them, don't we? You shifted how you handle defect management, right? Um, uh, with with issue tracking, uh, and rather than using Discord for it, you're doing more on on GitHub issues. So, well, this is applicable for some large companies. I don't encourage it, or or large organizations like that. Two other strategies make use of a common analysis that I want to introduce, and, and it's this case, and it has to do with with the situation which is similar at some level. We have an unknown, which here is like the total number of fish we have in a lake, okay? And we're gonna try to figure out by a sample of these fish, using fish tags, we're gonna try to get a sense of how many fish are there out there we're not finding. We don't know, that we don't know. How many total fish out there? Um, so the idea is, you know, you want to estimate how many fish there are in your lake or your slough, right? And all you have is 100 fish that What would you do? What, what do you think you could do to try to estimate how many fish there are total in the lake? Can anyone give us a sense? Why, why would you have fish tags? How, how would those be useful? Fish tags tag the fins of fish so you know if you've seen that fish before. Yes, what would you do? Yeah, okay, so that's good. So you don't want to double count it, right? But there's actually a more structured idea than that. If one count, there's actually a whole, if you go talk in biology, they deal with this stuff all the time. Mark and recapture. Believe it or not, they do it for mosquitoes too. They like bark mosquitoes. Oh. And, and uh, to, to know if they've seen them before. Um, so they color them and they catch them, uh, catch them again. Um, and they, they can know the proportion of them they've got before. I'm giving away part of the story here. Um, it's called margin recapture. Go look at it. They do it for the year and so on. I had, had some uh, some members of my research group that were uh, invited to go do this for the year. Like uh, some colleagues of mine over at WCBM, they um, they go and they sample the earth, the, the earth um, and, and sort of make measurements on the deer and they have to capture it and they Use a helicopter and bags. They put the deer in a bag and they carry it in the helicopter to the sample station. Uh, it's they're pretty amazing. It's like an alien abduction of the deer. <laughs> and then they pick they measure it, then they pick it up in that helicopter and bring it back to where it was found and bring it. And then it like recovers and it remembers I was in the air, you know, or something. I can be like, I mean, that was serious. Except it's in a bag. It's just so yeah, uh, right, it's an analogy. Uh, I'm thinking if 
they have a hundred fish eggs, uh, the entire lake, they can pick out their part of the lake, count how many fish there are in that particular aspect, okay. and out of that, they know how many of the tank fish are there, they can use that to generalize okay. that density. And other yeah, factors. yeah, so you've got the basic idea. So you, you've got to get a bunch of tags, and then you've got to look at, for another set of fish, how many of them are in that original group of tags? That's that's the basic idea. Let's let's go through this. Let's go through a bit of the math. So the basic idea is what? you first, as Norman said, you tag or at least like fifty fish. That's fine. Okay. Um. Uh. And so here, so it's 50, 50 total tags. Um. These are we'll call them the seeded fish. Okay. The point is they're tagged on them so you may have to using the seeded fish. And then you go and maybe the next day or whatever, you, you catch you catch a hundred more fish. And suppose of those fish or a hundred fish, it's a hundred fish that you catch, say, the next day. It does when I say more, don't mean that it doesn't include the, the 50. Some of them could be. You could say next day, um, I'll say next day, uh you 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 uh catch a hundred fish. And suppose you found that five of them, of these ones that were caught, these hundreds, uh, are found to be tagged. What does that tell you about how many are in the pot? Okay, so again, you tag a total of 50. If you know in the pond there's 50 tag fish. The next day you catch 100 fish and you find five of those hundred are tagged, right? How many fish are in the pond in general? And in total, what do you think? Yeah, at least 95 of the feet. Sorry? At least 95 of the feet. 95 plus 50. Well, you, you know there are 50 there, and yes, it is true that, that 95 of them did, that you found didn't have pensions. So, so that's certainly a lower bound. There's actually a much better explanation possible. And what is it? Well, I'm going to walk you through the idea, but look. You you release 50 fish. Of these hundred, you find five of them were from those original 50 fish, right? Five of them. So that was 10% of the original catch you found in this, right? And, but, and you can imagine if those 50 fish you caught originally, 50 that you would tag. If those are much like other fish in the pond, it suggests that in catching these hundreds, like you caught 10% of the fish out there. Yeah, uh, I just got to that. So we have 100 to 5. Yep. And so with that ratio, uh, if we have 50, then we do 50 times 100 divided by 10. That is correct. That is correct. I mean, you can think of it either way. You could say, these five are ten percent of these fifty. So these five are ten. They're ten percent of these fifty. So you, so you could say, look, I, I must be catching about ten percent of the fish out there. And these hundreds, therefore, must be ten percent of the fish out there. So probably there's how many fish? That hundred and ten percent of it. There's a thousand fish, which which is fifty. Times a hundred over by five, by five. So that's exactly right. Um, since we caught ten percent of the tag fish with the later catch, we have to manage the pressure of all fish that we caught in the whole lot. Um, so those hundred are, are you know, ten percent of all, all fish, right? Um, okay. Well, uh, so so that's uh. That's good. Um, another way to say it is, you know, the total estimated count of fish in the whole pond times the fraction that you're catching is is a hundred, and so the total estimated count is a hundred divided by the fraction being caught. And we estimate the fraction being caught as five divided by fifty, because that you know that that gives us some basis for how what what fraction of the of the fish are we catching? Is five out of the fifty? You see the point there? Okay, now let's see how this 
And, and, and there's some assumptions here. There's some big assumptions, right? Um, the assumptions are like those 50 fish you originally caught, if those were just like the lazy fish, or, you know, the fish that the fish that were about to die anyway, or, or the fish that were near the surface, or something like that, they're not representative of all fish, right? Um, and so you might think, well, we're going to catch more of them next time again. Um, this, this assumes the catches of fish are independent, they're not that, you know, based on any particular way in which you're, 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 uh, you're fishing, not that you're catching the less elusive fish or whatever. So it's based on some assumptions, but it's better than having no idea at all, right? It's, it's unlikely that we have a million fish in the pond. And we certainly know it's at least, as Gene observed, 50 plus 95. I mean, no way it can't be less than that because we've seen that many fish, right? That many distinct fish. Okay, so there's two techniques that exploit this. And you'll find readily accessible ways of doing both. The first may be three And I don't recommend it, but it's a popular technique. And it goes by several things. It goes by defect seeding, error seeding, and bug seeding. The idea is, look, you have some defects out there that bind my people You know, you know, some, some of these things aren't your issues, but it's probably most. Not, not most. And you see a bunch of defects in people that you know about, and you can remove them. You see them in. Now, why would you see defects into your code? That sounds like what a malicious hacker will do or something. You know, someone with malign intent would see your code base with defects. Why, why would you see it with defects? Assuming you can easily remove, uh, you know, remove them. What, what, what do you do if you see it with defects? Yes, Mark. We can use the same principle as analogy, or we yeah. use that to estimate the goal on ground. That's right. So you could say, well, look, if we see the defects, if, if we find with our existing test a certain fraction of that, right? If, if we find, let's suppose we do our test week on them, we run our, our uh, test week, you know, uh, unit test, uh, system test, penetration test, the honking, et cetera. And if we both these needed defects, we only find 10% of them. And we have right now 100 known, 100 known um, defects that we had previously recorded in our code base. Probably that's only about 10% of the judging by this analysis. We're probably only finding something like about 10% of all defects with our with our test. Yes, uh, Arizona. Yeah, let's talk about this. So it turns out that there are tools that are called defect seeding tools. They're called mutation testing tools, error seeding, bug seeding. And they're existing tools that will you can run on your software and it will insert. <laughs> For you and record, like the location of defects. If I'm not mistaken, I think a number of them can insert it, run things, and then remove it. So, you know, it, can, it doesn't leave it, right? Um, mutation testing is a similar idea where it actually goes in and tweaks a line of your code. You know, maybe it will eliminate I plus plus, or maybe it you know, it, it uh, comments out a line or something. And basically you see, can you discover that error, right? Um, so the idea here is that, well, maybe maybe we'll talk about this. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, the, the tools provide this way of inserting these defects and or of mutating your code to cause presumptive defects. Um, you know, adding lines of code that shouldn't be there, deleting lines of code that are changing lines of code so that they do something slightly different, incrementing twice instead of once, those sort of things. Um, and they feed your test, we can catch it there, and then they remove it. 
Um, so this is related to mutation seeding, um, but you can, you can do it each way. You can insert new ones, you can do take the code base uh, a little bit. So the idea here is what the total defect that you have to make to be out there, but the same principle, just as, as Marmac said, you take the ratio of the total seeded defect that you introduce divided by the fraction that you found. And you multiply that by the total number of found defects that you have found in the system, right? So if you found 100 defects before the seeding, then you introduce 50 seeded defects, and you only find five. You find 10% of them, and you say, well, probably our test week is only finding about 10% of all the defects. So the 100 ones we had previously found are probably about 10% of all those out there. Do you understand the principle here? So you can do this. You can go out and find tools and they will insert these defects and they will help avoid them sticking there. Uh, and it will help you arrive at an estimate. The problem here is of course, uh, many folks, right? Um, some people may complain, developers may complain, you know, you made my code look low quality, right? Like I made this code correct. And then now, now you're, now you're like mutating it, and and it seems like there's a defect in there, even if it's transient, even if it goes away, like that they may not feel that's appropriate behavior, right? Um, also, attempted fixes for these defects, or 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 uh, uh, you know, the seeded bug may block another defect. Can you imagine that? Why would a seeded defect block another another defect? Why could it hide another? Could you imagine that? Okay, yeah. Uh, it causes like an exception. Yeah, it causes an exception that prevents the whole area of the system from being explored, right? To actually miss certain defects, including some of the seeded defects. Okay, what I really want to talk with you about, though, when what for you is very practical, actionable, teams in previous years of 371 have undertaken this very fruitfully and gotten good results. Team after team after team. Most years, it's all teams. I would encourage you to do it, and that's a lot of fun, too. It's called Defect Floor. It doesn't involve any teams. No mutating of your system. Instead, you're going to have two teams within your, within your team. Team one, trying to find defects. And independently, separately, without knowledge, without interaction, team two trying to find defects on the same code. So you run a bug part. Say for Saturday afternoon for six hours, two different teams are working on the code base independently and not communicating to find defects. One team finds, uh, that would be pretty good, team 400. The other team finds 350. And suppose we look, and there's only 150 in common between them. Should you be worried, or should you be happy? So let me ask a simpler question. Suppose of these 350 defects, all of them were in the 400. Should you be relieved or worried? If team B Found 350 defects, but they were all the same defects he made found. Would that be a cause for great concern or a cause for a bit of relief? Anyone? Okay, so someone says great concern. Why would it be great concern? So, so if, team, if, if team A found 400, team B found 350, but they were all among the 400, what sense did that? Both teams independently found the same defects. Yeah, and so we found both the defects. Yeah, you're finding lots of defects. These folks are finding lots of defects, but they're the same ones. So it's probably a limited pool. Maybe it's 400, maybe it's 500, but it's not much bigger. Let's suppose there's only one defect found in common between them. Should you be worried? Yeah, yeah. yeah you should be very worried. You'd be afraid, very, very afraid. Um, this. That would suggest there's a much larger set of defects, right? You get a third team, a fourth team, probably finding 100 
and they'd only find fuel problems. So probably, you know, the defects are legion, right? So just massive numbers out there. You're barely tip, you're getting to the tip of the iceberg here. So the defect pooling idea, which is the last of these methods I want to talk to, is very active. You have, you have, you have two independent pools of, of, of defects. These are from two different teams. They operate independently, no coordination, no knowledge of what the other is finding. That would screw it up. If, if, if one team hears, oh, look, you know, we're finding lots in the UI from the other team, that's really going to throw this up because they're going to start looking at the same area, right? Um, that's the full scope of software. Um, and I would suggest, you know, um, having two teams work at the same time, but it's going to be on one does it on Saturday when it's on Sunday or whatever. And the, same, the basic formula is the same. Um, you know, you have defects in school P divided by the defect, the ratio of those that are common to those who are part of my work. Uh, which, which turns out to be exactly the formula that I saw. This formula. The analogy is correct, right? Defects in pool P is just like the 100 fish we later caught. Defects in pool A are the, the, the seeded fish. And these defects in pool A and B are like the, the seeded fish that we caught among the 100. So this is like 100 divided by 5 divided by. So 100 divided by quantity, 5 divided by 50. So 100 divided by 0.1. This is 0.1 for that original analogy with, with fish. In other words, it would be about the total defect. It comes down to this one, right? Is there a fraction and the, the whole fraction is in the denominator here? It flips around. So defect equal A times defect will be divided by the defect. In that are in both. That's, that's the set that are in both here, right? So, very simple idea. Um, run and bug party. So, I'd like you to do this set up two independent teams, ideally at the same time, so there's no leakage of information, just not talking. To each other during the beyond the team. You could talk within. That's great. Within a team, share information. That's awesome. But just don't share information between the two teams that will go. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, what part is anyone to partake? Anyone to partake. It doesn't have to be an email. Yeah, it could be. You can, you can bring other people if you wanted to, if they're able to set the system, right? As long as they could interact with the system. Yeah. Well, you need to create a list of the defects, right? And one of the risks is if you just add them to GitHub issues, the other two might see them. So you're going to have to be a bit artful about this. I would suggest having a separate document for the duration of the bug farms where you list them out, and then you can just afterwards copy them into, you know, after the bug parties are over on both teams basis, you copy them into the GitHub issues. But you know you could have one Google Sheet for your team for 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 Team A and another Google Sheet for Team B. By the way, um, one team could test another team's software. Yeah, right. Like you, you could also do buddy team tests. I don't think about it Um, or you could grab people, you know, other things, right? Um, but the two teams should probably be a pretty similar size to be comparable and so on. Um. Be good. Uh, and you know, work to identify more defects. Um, and, and the key thing is you want you need to go through the list that's found and identify ones you call. That was the key thing. And I think our son was alluding to that. You have to find if it's the same defect. I think for your system, it shouldn't be too far. It's a small enough system, right? Um, there's not like Overwhelming functionality available in that, just you know, that blows the mind, right? Um, and every bit of the blow mind. Um, yeah, she's are we testing the entire protein? No, we test the entire code, both both teams to test the entire code. Yeah, 
not not just the four. And, and it's important that they set these both teams are testing the entire company. You don't want one saying we're going to do drug testing, the other say you're going to back in, and then they find nothing in common. And you run away through it. You know, we could be more, right? Because the reply is no, Tom, any regulations, infinite success, which you don't want. Um, I, 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 if, if you're doing it for documents and test plans and you know the test matrix and requirements, the description of them will be all over the map. And I think that like it'll be hard to put it all into maybe a comment format. And when you go to compare, um, there's just there's a lot of things to look at for all documents. I know because I read the and I know there's a lot there, but in terms of functionalities of your system, the functionality at this point is not overwhelming. Like there's only so many features to test and so many elements. So I would say focus on the code base. I think it's a smaller but contained space. And I think that the key issue, what fraction of implementation defects are you finding? You're right that there may still be some requirements defects. But I also question the degree to which you find them by reviewing it without the stakeholder present. Yeah. Um, just to follow up on that, what's the granularity of the defects? How how detailed do you know Well, well it has to be detailed enough that you know probably about the same one. And I think we're talking here about testing based methods. So uh, you know, presumably it's going to be failures, right? It's going to be occurrences of, you know, uh, login crashes with empty username, or, or it's going to be, you know, uh, update the password, um, accept empty string, or something like that. It's, it's going to be something that's pretty. The amenable to a pretty short functional description, I would, I would have um, But um, it has to be a bit different enough that you could recognize uh, that it's the same. And here, you know, what, what potential thing you could do is just say you're going to do UI based tests. That is possible, right? But the problem there is that your UIs may not allow you to, to reach certain areas of the code base still. So, um, I think you'll probably want to, to mix uh, different types of testing, some UI based, some some not. Um, so, uh, you know, right now in in issues, you record failures that are encountered in testing, right? And you resolve them. I know because I look at them in the incremental deliverables, and so like you should. You should be able to do something pretty similar here, I'd say. And the goal is not to be perfect about it. You might miss some overlap, et cetera, but the goal is to give some idea about what these, these are. And I think in six hours or four hours, you could probably get pretty far. And knowing like, you know, what what rough set of defect counts are there out there? I think last year some teams did two of these. Okay. So this is what I'd like you to do, okay? I'd like you to run at least one bar bug party within your teams, okay? And uh, and try to estimate the total number of defects and report for, for your documentation as a bug party. Who was on each team? How long you worked? If there were restrictions in what you were testing, like that both teams agreed will predominantly go through the UI and system tests or something like that. Um, uh, let me know how many defects each team found, and let me know how many were in common, and your total estimate of the number of defects. Yes, some of the defects. So, yeah. Does it just have to be the behavior of the code or can it be active? 
I mean, that gets more into peer review issues, right? And um, I'm not opposed to doing this for peer reviews. I, what I worry, though, about with peer reviews is that, um, that there might not be time within, like, if, if your whole team spent, so remember, you have to break up the decisions. So these teams are not going to be more than five people each, right? And well, if, if if you're doing it for your project, right? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what that reaction was. Um, okay, so uh, what are we done? Like six people in your team, or what? <laughs> what should I smile back at you? <laughs> Okay, um, I'm always welcome news. Um, so, uh, so if you were to divide your team up in this way, one thing that's certainly true is you couldn't grab a uh, person off the street or a, another person outside your team easily to conduct a, a peer review. And second of all, it's going to require a lot of time. I, I question how much peer reviewing you could get done in four hours. I mean, if you get some done, it's not going to find dozens of people. And based on past bug parties, um, you know, teams have found dozens of defects. They found 30 defects, 25 defects, 40 defects in that six hours or whatever. So I'd say do it with testing, don't do it with, with peer reviews, as much as I love peer reviews. Okay. So that's what I suggest. Yes, the pop quiz is that bad, eh? Um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>